Hello everyone, happy Friday. For Telesera, I'm Cody Weddle in Caracas, Venezuela. To begin today, we begin here in Venezuela with the president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro. He has called for a popular economic congress next Wednesday to formulate strategies to move forward following Sunday's electoral defeat. Now, Maduro spoke on Thursday to participants attending the country's community congress where he took on a tone of self-reflection, calling on his party and supporters to examine the reasons behind the defeat. Hundreds of people from various social movements and collectives took part in the Congress to reflect on the loss and to, to uh, unite around an agen agenda in order to move the socialist movement forward here in Venezuela and the rest of Latin America. Now, since the loss, Maduro has reshuffled and restructured his cabinet, and he's also vowed to veto potential amnesty laws from the opposition. Now, he has also announced plans to sign into law a decree to protect workers across the country for the next three years. Meanwhile, former Cuban President Fidel Castro has written a letter to Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro to express his support after the disappointing electoral results. In his letter, Fidel highlights the important social and economic gains achieved under the leadership of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela, the PSUV, particularly in the areas of education, health, and economic sovereignty. The Venezuelan opposition has published a list of laws that it wants to pass or to overturn its to-do list, if you will, which would dramatically change the country's political and social landscape. Now, let's run through them here for a second. The first proposal on the MUDS website is to revoke the fair prices and food security laws, which aim to provide Venezuelans with cheap access to basic necessities. The opposition says this would overcome the problem of shortages. Then, two other laws would open the way to privatizations. One would reverse the nationalization of some strategic enterprises. Another would, quote, decentralize public services, handing them over to local authorities and giving these the right to subcontract private service providers. A third law in this area would open up concessions for large infrastructure projects to foreign investors and multilateral uh, financing institutions. Then, the problem of crime would be tackled by giving more power to municipal and state police forces, which are often controlled by opposition local governments. Now, you remember it was in 2002 uh, that the municipal police here in Caracas played a key role in the failed coup attempt against late President Hugo Chavez. Then, uh, to uh, talk about the media, the opposition majority in parliament proposes a law to, quote, end hegemony in the, in the public media and ensure, quote, the independence of those in charge of those media outlets. Venezuela's parliament has passed a proposal to give ownership of the National Assembly's television station to its workers. Now, this move comes after Venezuelan opposition leader Henry Ramos Alup announced intentions of major changes at that TV station as part of a massive overhaul of the Socialist Party's policies. With the latest now, our correspondent here in Caracas, Isabel Fimbo. ANTV is the official channel of Venezuela's National Assembly. It broadcasts debates to make Parliament's decision-making more transparent. This channel is really important for lawmaking because it opens the door on what happens inside the chamber. Something that in the past was totally closed. Nobody knew. The people didn't even know who the deputies were in the National Assembly. Venezuela's opposition coalition announced this week that it wants to close or restructure ANTV as part of a string of reforms after it won a supermajority in last Sunday's elections. That person yesterday was speaking against the media, and we strongly rejected declarations that the opposition leader made against people with families, journalists, against freedom of the press, and against this channel. The closure or restructuring of the channel would not only put an end to a valued service, it would also put the jobs of more than 300 employees at risk. It's worrying. Here in the channel we feel worried because until January 5th arrives, we don't know what's going to happen. 
To prevent the station from closing, leaders of the Venezuelan government proposed handing ownership of the station over to its workers, a move that was passed by the National Assembly. They have spoken very clearly. The channel will be handed over to its workers to continue telling the truth about parliament. It is possible that the new National Assembly with an opposition majority will do away with all the laws of the revolution, and no doubt with us too. The opposition has said that when the new National Assembly sits here again in January, it will try and remove President Nicolas Maduro from office and overhaul the constitution. Now, AMTV might pass the hands of its workers, and if it does, it will be one of the few public institutions safe. It's Balfin Botelizo in Caracas. And the new Argentinian president, Mauricio Macri, to move on, has presented his cabinet. Now, most of them, they're linked to neoliberal tendencies. Live now to Buenos Aires, the capital of uh, Argentina. We turn to our correspondent, Laureano uh, Ponce. Uh, so, Laureano, what can we expect from this new cabinet, this new government, uh, especially in terms of uh, ec economic and uh, economic policies and, uh, and also social achievements, social welfare, if you will? Hello to you, Kurt, and to the audience. Well, as you said, most of Macri's cabinet comes from the corporate sector. There are several executives from uh, some major uh, companies, some major international companies, such as uh, banks, JP Morgan or HSBC, that are now in public office. And despite they come from the private sector, they also have uh, taken part in the uh, Buenos Aires city government, together with Mauricio Macri. Many of them were part of his cabinet as uh, Buenos Aires mayor, so we already know some of the political orientations they will take. Right now, local media outlets are reporting that uh, the new finance minister, Alfonso de Brad Guy, who is a former JP Morgan executive, is trying to obtain around $8 billion from private banks from the United States in order to release the uh, controls on forex operations. This is also going to be uh, followed by a currency devaluation that will take the value of the Argentine peso in relation to the dollar from $9.5 right now to around 15, uh, 16 dollars, uh, I'm sorry, 16 pesos per dollar. That will mean uh, pretty much a 50% currency devaluation that is already uh, hitting the prices of the uh, consumer goods. Many consumers here in Argentina that are also goods such as Argentine meat and meat or soybean or uh, even wheat are already seeing their prices rise because they already know that the government is going to take on uh, a devaluation. So they know that their, their products are going to be uh, much higher, are going to have much higher prices maybe in one month from now. So this is already hitting the consumer prices in Argentina. People are already feeling that because the salaries haven't been increased yet. But that also anticipates one of the conflicts that will most likely um, hit the beginning of the next year, beginning of 2016, when the unions start to demand wage bargaining, collective wage bargaining process, and that would, means, uh, that would mean also that the government will have to take place. Either they're going to favor the unions or they're going to favor the private sector. Of course, with a cabinet like this, we always, uh, and with the, the president that we know from the Buenos Aires city government, what we can say is that most likely the government will favor the private sector. Cody. Quickly here, Laudiano, it would appear just looking on there from Argentina, we saw a former president, Cristina Fernandez, she really went out with a bang there. She had that massive rally. It would appear that she doesn't plan to sort of just go back to private life. Do we know how she plans or whether she plans uh, to remain politically active, Cristina Fernandez? Well, uh, former president Cristina Fernandez hasn't revealed what she's going to do exactly. But she has said something about that in her last speech as head of state um, just a few days ago. She said that the, um, the true place of a political activist is not meant to be the government, but it's meant to be with the people and working for the people. So what we expect is that Cristina Fernandez is going to remain politically active despite she doesn't have any kind of uh, public office. She didn't run for Congress. She didn't run for governor of her province in Santa Cruz. But she is going to remain active. We also have to take in mind uh, to take into consideration two things. One of them is that uh, one of the most important political organizations here in Argentina, which is known as La Campora, she is very related to that. Actually, the head of that organization is her son, Maximo Kirchner, who is now a national lawmaker. He became a, a member of parliament in the last election, 
and in the province where she comes from, the province of Santa Cruz in the south of Argentina, is going to be uh, governed by her sister-in-law, Alicia Kirchner, who is the sister of former President Nestor Kirchner. So despite Cristina Fernandez herself does not have any place in public office, many of the people who are uh, with her politically uh, and has, have been with her in the last years are going to have the places in public office and she's going to remain active. The massive rally that um, said farewell to her in some way also is a very important uh, thing to take into consideration because despite many, many times here in Argentina we see massive rallies in order to support a candidate, in order to support a government measure, this time it was a massive rally that was only meant to say goodbye to uh, So this also shows the popular support that Cristina Fernandez still uh, finds here in Argentina. I don't think there's any doubt now, after seeing those images, that she retains a lot of support among a lot of sectors there in Argentina. Laureano, thanks so much. Thanks to you. Goodbye. We go to Chile now. Uh, fathers of the 43 students disappeared last year in Mexico in Ayotzinapa. They're in Chile to seek support for their cause there. Now, they offered a press conference in Santiago's Universidad Tecnológica Metropolitana on Thursday, where they requested once again the Mexican government to follow the recommendations of the group of independent experts who rejected the official version. Now, the version said that their sons had been killed and incinerated by drug traffickers. Meanwhile, Mexico's former attorney general clings to the official version of what happened to the students. Mexico's former Attorney General Jesus Murillo Caram, who was removed from his post this past February, is reportedly uh, maintaining his so-called polemic historic truth in the Ayotzinapa case that the 43 youth were murdered by organized crime, burned in a garbage dump in the Guerrero State town of Cocula, and their remains dispersed in a river. Now, this line of investigation that provoked a great deal of anger uh, among many in Mexican society and rejection by the families of the students has been essentially disqualified by the team of independent experts uh, from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights who, uh, through a thorough investigation, determined that this hypothesis by Murillo Karam is scientifically impossible. Now, this past Monday, the team reported uh, new findings that even further puts in doubt the government's uh, historic truth lines, given that satellite images and meteorological data uh, coincides that there was never even a blaze the night the students were forcibly disappeared by police in Guerrero. Now, this information on Murillo Karam uh, was provided by the president of the Congressional Committee tasked to also investigate the Ayotzinapa case. Her name is Guadalupe Murilla, who affirmed that she had a private meeting with Murillo Karam in which uh, he continues to support his original line of investigation. However, other members of the committee are criticizing Morguilla and Karam for speaking on the issue in private. Also, many point to the fact that Murillo Karam's historic truth hypothesis was grounded primarily on four presumed confessions. It's Clayton Khan reporting for Telesur here in Mexico City. Former Panamanian President uh, Ricardo Martinelli, Martinelli has appeared before the country's Supreme Court under a case of illegal spying during his administration. Now, Martinelli is also facing trial in relation to an insider trading scandal for which he was stripped of his immunity by the Supreme Court. The multimillionaire uh, supermarket tycoon left Panama in January and is believed to be in Miami now. Apart from the espionage case, he is facing half a dozen corruption probes, including charges of embezzlement, taking bribes, and selling pardons. Drug traffickers are exercising influence over domestic politics in Peru in order to protect themselves from judicial prosecution. Now, this is according to a long investigation by a legislative commission led by progressive lawmaker Rosa Mavila. The report says that criminal groups are looking to fund electoral campaigns to buy influence and are even showing an interest in creating political parties of their own. The, doc the document recommends immediately removing lawmakers under investigation and urges the financial investigative body to freeze a suspect's bank accounts. Mavila is seeking to create another commission to investigate the infiltration of drug trafficking into armed forces. 
And uh, they're in Peru now, uh, which has an end endemic a problem with domestic violence against women. With an explanation now uh, on that problem, we turn to our correspondent there in Lima, Rao Mora. Since she was 13 years old, Gladys Melgar became the victim of sexual and physical violence by the hands of the man who became her husband and father to her children. I have marks on my legs too. At one time he threw something lit up at me and was able to damage my legs. He burned my legs. He was very violent. I have never wanted to tell anybody about this, not my parents, nor my sons and my daughters, but I think it's necessary. Gladys was able to gain strength, ask for help and escape from that relationship, but there are thousands of women who are not able to. In Peru, flags were raised when the Ministry of Women inaugurated an awareness campaign and the free helpline for victims received 3,500 calls from abused women in one month. They call Line 100 and there we give them orientations. This line is free. In addition, it is servicing 24 hours a day and 7 days a week. And therefore, it is a friendly line that all women can use without fear because their name or their situation are not revealed. The Office of the Ombudsman argues that the ultimate stage of violence against women is femicides, and the way to avoid reaching that step is to intervene as soon as the first violent acts take place. However, they found the justice system is failing to proceed adequately. In 81% of the cases, the prosecutors did not emit protective measures. An important finding linked to the previous context is the difficulty that exists for the women victims of violence in terms of receiving an adequate response from the administrative system of justice so that those cases do not end up as one more figure in the number of victims murdered by their partners or former partners. In the country between 2012 and 2015, there were 356 murders of women by their partners and 174 attempts. Rael Mora, Telesur, Peru. So far, the climate talks in Paris, they failed to reach uh, to achieve an agreement on key pillars of the planned post-2020 climate pact. The final agreement was set to be presented this Friday, December 11th, but talks have run over. This is due to the rifts uh, between uh, the rifts uh, between uh, the richer and poorer nations. Developing nations have insisted that established economic powerhouses should uh, shoulder the lion's share of responsibility as they have emitted most of the greenhouse gases since the Industrial Revolution. Negotiators at the Paris Summit aim to wrap up the global agreement to curb climate change on December 12th instead. We are extremely close to the finish line. We need to show the necessary responsibility to find a common ground in the next coming hours. Anyway, it is time to reach a conclusion. And for more, for more information now on uh, what's going on there today, specifically at the conference, we turn to our special correspondent uh, there, Allison uh, Kentish. Allison, tell us about this second draft. It seems like uh, the nations gathered there that they're, they're not able to reach this final agreement. Uh, what, what are some of the key differences there? And is there any signals of whether they will be able to settle uh, on an agreement or not? Hi, good evening to you, Cody, and to all our listeners and viewers. Well, I can tell you that people who were looking forward and eagerly anticipating a final agreement here in Paris today have been hugely disappointed. And earlier this morning, uh, the French foreign minister, that Laura Fabio, announced that efforts to land that deal uh, fell apart on Friday. But he announced that he's going to be hard at work with the negotiators throughout this evening, and he will have a final document tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. I can tell you that nations are disappointed, especially some of the small nations, small island states in the Caribbean. They have expressed a certain level of disappointment, but they are holding out hope. They say that the latest draft document is not exactly what they wanted, but they, to quote them, they are not unhappy with it, but they would have wanted more. I can tell you that the sticking points remain money, they're debating financial issues, as well as mitigation and adaptation issues. 
What about uh, that? You've been keeping a close eye on the Caribbean countries. Uh, what have they uh, been saying about this draft, uh, and why exactly do do they think that they are, their considerations are being taken into account? Well, one thing I can tell you, speaking to the head of the CARICOM delegation, that is CARICOM, which is made up of 15 small island states in the Caribbean, they're saying that some of their key allies whom they depended on to be on the side of the Caribbean, because they are fighting for the survival of Caribbean countries, which are already feeling the impact of climate change. And they came to COP21, hoping that they could rely on some of their partners, some of the countries that they do have diplomatic relations with. And uh, I can tell you that one of those holding out on the 1.5 degree cap um, is um, most of the countries so are holding out on that cap belong to the United Arab Emirates. And somehow the Caribbean felt that they have that support going in, but Saudi Arabia in particular is holding out. They are not for most of what the Caribbean wants. And that's a big surprise for the Caribbean. They're a bit disappointed, but they're holding out with that some sort of agreement, some sort of compromise can be reached between now and that time, 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Right, Allison. Thanks uh, once, uh, once again. You're welcome. A joint team of serious political and armed opposition will meet uh, with the government next month to seek a politi political solution to nearly five years of conflict. More than 100 members of serious opposition parties and rebel fighting groups agreed in Riyadh to work together to prepare for peace talks with the government of President Bashar al-Assad. A statement at the end of the two-day conference said that Assad should leave power at the end at the start, rather, of a transitional period and called for an all-inclusive democratic civic state. It also committed to preserving state institutions. Staying on the topic of Syria now, President Vladimir Putin has said that Russia is supporting uh, uh, the opposition Free Syrian Army by providing it with air support, weapons, and ammunition. He added that his country is also conducting joint operations with regular Syrian forces against Islamic militants. Putin's statement is the first time Moscow appears to admit that it supports the opponents of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad in the fight against the so-called Islamic State group. A man has been shot dead during a police operation in the north of London. Uh, now, according to a statement from the Metropolitan Police there, the oper their operation was, quote, intelligence-led and not, not related to terrorism. Now, London is currently tackling its uh, current gun problem by carrying out a coined operation, Kestrel, which involves dozens of raids across the city. So far, in 2015, there have been over 300 firearm-related incidents. The White House announced Thursday that President Barack Obama could use his power of executive action to expand background checks on gun sales. Now, this announcement was made on the same day that dozens of family members affected by gun violence went to Washington, D.C. to demand action from Congress. Our correspondent Bianca Perez now reports from Washington. My name is Melody McFadden. My niece, Sandy Geddes, was shot and killed in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. These are the faces of some of the victims of gun violence in the United States. With pained expressions, their family members demand action to solve what they characterize as a public health epidemic. Milagros is the mother of Alexandria Burgos, a young girl who was hit and killed instantly by a stray bullet in Chicago in 2014. She was a freshman in college. Her dream was to be a social worker and to help other youth, and now that dream is ended. And I am here to help other mothers, other families who's lost their child, but not only that, they lost their child, to prevent all families from losing their child or a family member. Maria lost her son, Ricky Pike, to gun violence in Chicago on August 12, 2012. She feels indignation and sadness that no action has been taken by the government when it comes to gun control. Within your conscience that you, that you have not done anything, anything to solve our, our, you know, to solve our pain. It is uh, it's unbelievable. None of these victims are related to members of Congress, which raises the question, would this make a difference? 
another mass shooting, and then we stand up, we sit down and do nothing. I don't stand up anymore. I can't be a part of the hypocrisy. And I want to ask my colleagues, who has to die? Your wife? Your mother? Your brother? Your son? Just who is it that has to die? A big thanks to the More than 100,000 people are shot in the United States every year. Democratic members of Congress joined the families to ask that the memories of their loved ones be honored, not with moments of silence, but with concrete action. We have many moments of silence on the floor of the House, but we must not remain silent. If that silence is not replaced by action, we do not deserve the honor of even having a moment of silence. This is my sister Kirsten. An average of 289 people are shot daily in the United States. Of these, 86 die. These families raise the question, how many more need to die before steps are taken to stop the violence? Bianca Perez, Telesur, Washington, D.C. No one would have blamed uh, Adriana Restrepo for giving up hope after her partner was violently killed in Colombia when she uh, was 18 years old and pregnant. But Restrepo decided to make beauty out of trash and also hire other victims of the country's armed conflict to help her. Now, Restrepo is a fashion designer and environmentalist uh, who fashionably, uh, who fashionable home de decor and accessories from trash she collects. Now, 15 years later, Restrepo markets her creations all over the world through her Facebook page. And she also teaches young people looking to break into the fashion industry. That's what we're covering on this Friday uh, afternoon here from Caracas. Plenty more on all of those stories and others at our website, telesurtv.net slash English. Join us on social media, Twitter. Facebook and Instagram. For Tell Us Our English, I'm Cody Weddle. Have a great weekend.